The next item of business is debate on motion 16038 in the name of Fiona Hislop on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to and move the motion for around 11 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, I'm very pleased to open this Stage 1 debate on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill and I move the motion in my name. Uh, I'm looking forward to what I know will be an interesting debate today. Uh, the consideration by the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee through Stage 1 has been comprehensive. Uh, the evidence provided by stakeholders has been excellent, providing varying views on these very sensitive matters. And I'm grateful to everyone that has contributed thus far to the Census Bill, and today is another step on this journey. Before I talk about the Bill, I would like to take a moment to speak more generally about the Census. Uh, the next Scotland Census will be taken on Sunday the 21st of March 2021, subject to the approval of the Scottish Parliament. This will be the 22nd Census to take place and the 17th to be managed independently here in Scotland. For the first time in 2021, it will also be predominantly online. Our country has relied on the census for over 200 years and it is the only survey of its kind to ask everyone in Scotland the same questions at the same time. No other survey provides the richness and range of information that the census does. The key aspects of the census is that it counts people. It has to be credible. People have to have confidence in it and it needs to be consistent with other comparators. The census tells us who we are how we live and work in Scotland. But in telling that story, the census cannot lead society. It should reflect the society we live in. We are very proud of the richness of data that we hold and the consistency of approach we can demonstrate over these 200 years. So moving on to the census bill itself, the purpose of the bill is to amend the 1920 Census Act to allow questions on sexual orientation and prescribed aspects of gender identity, those being of transgender status and history, to be asked on a voluntary basis. The power to ask these questions on a compulsory basis already exists in the Census Act, but refusing to answer a census question or neglecting to do so is an offence under the Section 8 of the Census Act 1920, and we want to avoid that for individuals answering these new questions. I recognise that these are important whilst highly personal matters. It is critical that nobody is or feels in any way compelled to answer these important but sensitive questions. Therefore, the Bill seeks to mitigate any concerns about intrusion into private life by placing these questions on a voluntary basis, as was done with religion when it was included for the first time in the 2001 Census. I'm therefore pleased that the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee have supported the general principles of the Bill. In terms of the specific census questions, I wish to stress that these are still a work in progress. The bill is not about the detail of the questions. The questions set for the 2021 census will be considered as part of the subordinate legislation process on which engagement with the committee will begin shortly and continue throughout ne through next year. Um, sexual orientation is already uh, asked in most Scottish household surveys and it is proposed that the sexual orientation question for the 2021 census would mirror the question already used in other surveys in Scotland and elsewhere in the UK. It's worth noting that a question on sexual orientation for the 2011 census was considered. However, it was not proposed to Parliament due, due to a lack of public acceptance of asking that question uh, at that time. Society has changed significantly and rapidly in the 10 years since the last census. And so we must ensure the census in 2021 reflects that. I am therefore happy that the committee recognises that now is the time to ask a question on sexual orientation in the census and to do so on a voluntary basis. I have also confirmed my support for the committee recommendation to consider the privacy rights when the form is being completed by the head of the household. NRS will take into consideration the committee's direction on consulting with organisations representing young people, including LGBT Youth Scotland. The National Records of Scotland is developing a system of completion of an individual form in private where no one else in the household will be aware that it has been requested. This will allow individuals to respond in a private and confidential way. 
It is also uh, widely recognised that there is limited evidence on the experiences of transgender people in Scotland, with currently no fully tested question with which to collect information. Therefore, the census would be taking a big step forward to ensure that we can develop the evidence needed to provide support and protection for Scotland's transgender population. The committee highlighted that the current drafting of the bill, and in particular the way the term gender identity has been used, may give the impression that sex and gender identity are being conflated. The intention behind the census bill has never been to conflate sex and gender identity. The committee recommends that an, an amendment is required at stage two, which I agree is required, and they support a proposed amendment by the Equality Network to address this issue. I have confirmed to the committee that we will work with them, the Equality Network and other stakeholders to deliver a solution that commands broad support while providing the degree of flexibility that the National Records of Scotland need to develop the census questions. Work has already begun on the precise form of an amendment and what it might, uh, what it might take. Um, our current thinking and that of the Equality Network does not seem to be very far apart. I'm very pleased that the committee supports the inclusion of the trans status question on a voluntary basis. A question on sex uh, asking whether someone is male or female has been asked in the census uh, since it began in 1801. As part of planning for 2021, the National Records of Scotland have been considering whether this question should have other options. I'm aware that there are strong and often very opposed views on whether a question on sex should be binary, non-binary, relate to birth certificates, legal sex, or more focused on self-identification. This has been evident from the evidence gathered through the stage one submissions for the bill. Uh, I note that the committee has recommended that the sex question for 2021 should remain on a binary basis. As I said a few moments ago, the wording of the questions will be agreed as part of the subordinate legislation process. However, I note the clear direction from the committee at this time on what they consider appropriate for the sex question. This will now be taken into account as National Records of Scotland work towards preparation of the subordinate legislation and its consideration by the committee and parliament in due course. National Records of Scotland are committed to an ongoing programme of testing around this question and are currently engaging with stakeholders to understand their needs and concerns, including those that have been given evidence to the committee. NRS will work closely with the committee over the coming months on this specific question, as well as sharing the proposed full question set for consideration, including any additional evidence and stakeholder views before the formal legislative process. I recognise that the committee considers it regrettable that intersex was referred to as coming within the term trans in the policy memorandum to the bill. It was unfortunate that the policy memorandum incorrectly included intersex people under the umbrella term trans. In response to the committee recommendation that all guidance for 2021 will make it clear that intersex does not fall within the term trans, NRS will develop guidance and consult with stakeholders to ensure that the language and terminology are acceptable. The Scottish Government has noted the written evidence by the organisation DSD Families and accepts the recommendation in paragraph 119 of the committee's report. The Scottish Government intends to carry out a consultation later this year, which is separate from the census work. Um, this will cover a range of issues, including how to improve information and services for intersex children and children who have variations in sex characteristics and their families. On consultation, I recognise that the committee has expressed concerns around the lack of engagement with a range of groups and individuals. National Records of Scotland carried out a public consultation between the 8th of October 2015 and the 15th of January 2016 in order to understand what information users needed from the census in 2021. And it is recognised that not all groups were aware of or responded to the public consultation and the committee made specific reference to women's groups. Please note that no women's groups responded to the public consultation and some may well not have uh, been established at the early consultation uh, stage. However, National Records of Scotland is now actively engaging with the women's groups who responded to the committee's call for evidence. This includes several very helpful and constructive meetings which took place in January. As I said to the committee, it is of critical importance that NRS continue to engage with individuals and groups with an interest in the census and the committee work has been very useful to highlight the census to those that have been engaged, uh, that have been engaged with uh, so far. 
work with stakeholders, including those women's groups, will continue as part of question development. The committee will be fully updated on the consultation National Records of Scotland has carried out, including progress made with the women's groups prior to any consideration of a draft census order. There was also a specific request by the committee for details of consultations held with those representing intersex people and a recommendation for a specific consultation going forward. I have confirmed that NRS did not meet with organisations representing intersex people prior to December the 5th, 2018, but were aware of meetings that other teams within the Scottish Government were having. However, National Records of Scotland did have a helpful meeting with the organisation DSD Families in January and are committed to engaging with them, other organisations and experts going forward so that the views are taken into account. It should be noted that the NRS has never intended to have a question or response option identifying intersex people. On languages, uh, there was also a recommendation by the committee to give consideration to the evidence they received with regard to the language question for the 2021 census. I accepted this recommendation and this will contribute to the ongoing process of user consultation and question testing. However, please note that while some need was identified for multilingualism, the aim of the main language question is actually to identify people for whom English is not their main language and the level of proficiency in English in order to support service provision. So, presiding officer, to conclude, I wish to recognise that in Scotland we have a, a strong track record of evidence-based decision-making and the census is a key source of high-quality, impartial evidence to support those decisions. The matters we're considering today would allow accurate information to be gathered on important topics in an appropriate way, recognising individuals' rights to privacy. So, presiding officer, uh, having moved the motion, I look forward to hearing from parliamentary colleagues here today during this debate. Thank you. I now call John McAlpine to speak on behalf of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee for around nine minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak as convener of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee and set out the main findings of our Stage 1 report. I thank all those who have provided oral and written evidence, the breadth of views gathered and the respectful way in which these were discussed does credit to the committee. And I also thank our clerks. This one-page bill has turned out to involve a lot of work, but they have more than risen to the challenge. And thanks also to committee members for the constructive approach they took to evaluating the evidence. The bill seeks to enable questions on gender identity and sexual orientation to be asked in the census on a voluntary basis for the first time. And the committee unanimously agreed that this should be done. In the course of the committee's scrutiny of the bill, we heard that sexual orientation is a well understood term, but that gender identity has no defined meaning in law. In responding to the evidence received by the committee, the NRS explained that it would reconsider the terminology used on the face of the bill, including whether to replace the term gender identity with trans status. Stonewall and Scottish Trans Alliance, who advise the Scottish Government, informed the committee that they define transgender as including all the identities that are encompassed within the trans umbrella. The trans umbrella is very broad and encompasses people who have chosen to undergo physical changes, as well as people who have undergone no physical changes but have a trans identity. To be clear, trans umbrella in, uh, includes transgender, as well as gender queer, gender fluid, non-binary, gender variant, cross-dresser, genderless, agender, non-gender, third gender, two-spirit, bi-gender, as well as trans men, trans women, trans masculine and trans feminine. It should be noted that the bill itself does not address how to frame the questions on trans status or history in the 2021 census and Parliament will consider this along with other questions on the census in the secondary legislation to come. Uh, the committee agreed that these questions will benefit LGBT people as they will allow the government to better meet their needs. The committee also agreed that given their sensitivity, no one should be compelled to answer questions on trans, trans status or history or sexual orientation. These must be voluntary. And we agreed with LGBT Youth Scotland that the privacy of young people must be protected when the form is completed by a head of household. And I note what the Cabinet Secretary has said in that regard. Presiding officer, while the committee supports the general principles of the bill, we have concerns about its drafting. 
The Bill proposes to make ch changes to the schedule of the 1920 Census Act to insert the words including gender identity after the word sex in paragraph 1, and there is a danger that this appears to conflate two different things. Sex is a protected characteristic under the Equality Act 2010, whereas the committee heard that gender identity has no defined meaning in law. Gender reassignment is also a protected characteristic in the Equality Act, but it's very distinct from the characteristic of sex. The sex-based protections in the Equality Act are particularly relevant for women and girls based on birth sex. For example, the Act allows for single-sex services and occupations where this is a proportionate means of protecting the safety, privacy and dignity of females. Some witnesses argued that these protections would be compromised if sex was perceived to be conflated with gender identity. Others disagreed and stated that the Equality Act also protects those with gender reassignment. Accordingly, the committee welcomes the proposal from the Equality Network to remove the, the words including gender identity from the bill, leaving paragraph one of the 1920 schedule unchanged. Trans status history would then be added as a category on the same basis as proposed for sexual orientation. This suggestion reflects the committee's own thinking. We note that the Cabinet Secretary has agreed amendments are needed and welcome her commitment to bring forward an amendment at stage two. I would also welcome clarification from the Cabinet Secretary upon closing that her amendment will have the effect of removing any linkage to the sex question. The problems with this aspect of the bill seem to be due to a consultation which focused only on a very small number of stakeholders and didn't include women's groups or census data users. The NRS's own topic report on the census initially seemed to understand the importance of sex, saying it is a vital input to population, household and other demographic statistics. Uh, I'm afraid I can't because I'm speaking for the committee. Uh, which um, are used, these statistics on sex, are used by central and local government to inform resource allocation, target investment and carry out service planning and delivery. It goes on to say sex is a protected characteristic as set out in the Equality Act 2010 and that the data is widely used to inform equality impact assessments. However, NRS changed the mandatory sex question in 2011 to allow respondents to self-identify as male or female. This change was not mentioned on the census form itself and only appeared in online guidance. NRS proposed to continue this approach in 2021 and are considering whether to make the question non-binary for the first time. That is, to offer a third option in addition to male and female. For clarity, this is not to be confused with the new trans status question, and it would be a change to the sex question, which has been male or female since 1801. Some witnesses suggested that this risks undermining the effectiveness of the data collected. And these included Professor Susan McVie, OBE, co-director of the Administrative Data Research Centre in Scotland and a member of the Board of Official Statistics. The board advised the Scottish Government, but they were not consulted on the census. Professor McVeigh suggested that NRS quotes got it wrong when they redefined the sex question to include self-identified gender in 2011. She told us, from a research point of view, we know that certain conditions, medical conditions, for example, are sex-related regardless of a person's gender identity. That position was supported by some clinicians, independent women's groups, academics and individual women who submitted evidence. Others stated that it would be distressing for transgender people, including those who identify as non-binary, to answer a question according to their biological sex. They included Scottish Trans Alliance, Stonewall, individual trans people, gender studies academics and some women's organisations that advise the Scottish Government, such as in gender. Significantly, the Office of National Statistics say that the sex question should remain binary for the 2021 census in England and Wales. The ONS Equality Impact Assessment for the Census states, quote, the protected characteristic of sex as defined in the Equality Act 2010 is whether a person is a man or a woman. This binary concept of sex is in turn fundamental to the Equality Act's definition of sexual orientation and of gender reassignment and to the law on marriage, civil partnership and many other matters. Our committee agreed by majority that the sex question should remain binary in order to maximise response rates and longitudinal consistency with previous censuses. We unanimously recommended that any guidance on how to answer the sex question, excuse me, my 
surface is gone strange. <laughs> um, We unanimously recommended that any guidance on how to answer the sex question must be clearer and consider the importance of sex as a protected characteristic. The committee also took evidence from DSD families who represent those who are affected by differences of, in sexual development, which encompass about 40 different medical conditions and is sometimes called intersex. They were unhappy with the term intersex being included in a, in, as trans identity in the policy memorandum accompanying the bill. Um, intersex is an umbrella term relating to a person's physical sex development and not their gender identity. Uh, furthermore, uh, DSD families explained that the vast majority of people with DSD are clearly male or female. They told the committee that while rep some reports claim that 1.7% of the population is affected by some kind of DSD, only a tiny number, one in five and a half thousand babies, requires specialist input to determine their sex. Therefore, in the view of DSD families, the term intersex can be confusing. While we were aware of intersex campaigners who take a different view, it is concerning that a respected organisation like DSD families, despite being a Scottish charity, were not initially consulted by NRS. And we note that the government now accepts a mistake was made and we welcome their commitment to engage with a wider range of stakeholders in future, including DSD families. Presiding officer, in conclusion, this illustrates the wider problem with the con consultation on the bill. While transgender campaigners and some established women's organisations support the bill, a number of female academics, data users, individual campaigners and newly formed independent female rights organisations have concerns around the conflation of sex and gender and the perceived risk to sex-based protection for women and girls. The broadening of public discourse on these issues must inform future consultation in this topic. The Scottish Government should reach out to the widest constituency and carefully consider all the evidence gathered by this committee. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the committee supports the general principle of the Bill and looks forward to fully scrutinising the forthcoming secondary legislation pertaining to the 2021 Census in due course. Thank you. I call Annie Wells for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As society's attitudes have changed, it is only right that the census reflects this. And at stage one, the Scottish Conservatives are happy to support this bill and its general principles with a view to submit amendments in st at stage two. And as we've heard, a lot of discussion remains to be had on the wording of the questions. And it will be important in later stages to discuss this in a lot more detail. It will also be important to address how the census will define, structure and communicate the voluntary questions on the sexual orientation and gender identity. The purpose of the bill is simple, to allow National Records Scotland to alter the current census and vary the questions it asks. The census, as we know, is important for many reasons. Completed every 10 years and the next one will be in March 2021. It gives us a complete picture of the nation. The census provides information needed by governments in the UK to develop policy, plan and run public services and allocate appropriate funding. In terms of equality data, it is extremely useful, again providing the basis upon which to plan public services. And it is widely accepted that the current gaps in equality data and that this information is needed so that the public authorities can fulfil the public sector equality duty and duly consider the needs of protected groups under the Equality Act. And as we know, while the census covers most equality groups, it has not previously included questions about sexual orientation or gender identity. As social, as social attitudes change and discrimination lessens, it does make sense for the census questions to reflect society's views. Only 18% of people in Scotland expressed in 2015 the view that sexual relations between two adults of the same sex is always wrong. And only 32% of people said that they would be unhappy for a close relative to marry or form a relationship with someone who has undergone gender reassignment. But the purpose of the bill is to reflect this more open society. It aims to amend the Census Act to make answering questions on prescribed aspects of gender identity, trans status, history, and on sexual orientation voluntary. And it goes without saying that all this, this all needs to be done with care to ensure data quality, 
information should not be collected if it is not reliable or causes difficulty for people to answer accurately. Given the need for individual privacy, is, it is, given the need for individual privacy, it is right that these questions are answered on a voluntary basis, as was done on questions around religion in the 2011 census. And given the sensitivity of asking these questions, this is, of course, the correct approach. The development and testing of the census questions will continue, which is reassuring, and I am pleased that the inclusion and wording of questions will be subject to Parliament, the Scottish Parliament's approval. Although the actual inclusion or wording of any such questions is not within the scope of this bill, being left to regulations in due course, I would, however, like to make the following co comments, given the interest from third sector organisations on how such questions might be framed and understood. And I note concerns of the committee around the conflation of sex and gender identity, as well as concern that there was a lack of clarity around an awareness of the online guidance concerning the self-identification approach in 2011. And whilst recognising the valid and strongly held views of stakeholders on the mandatory sex question, I am inclined at this point to agree with the committee recommendations that the mandatory sex question should remain binary, having not been present at the committee's evidence sessions. Ahead of 2021, I hope that we will have complete clarity over the approach that is going to be taken. This is particularly important given the census' primary purpose is to collect robust data and the Scottish Government's obligation to act in accordance with the Equality Act 2010, in which sex is a protected characteristic. And I also note that the recommendation that trans status should be added as a category for census questions on the same basis proposed for sexual orientation. And as this bill progresses, I hope that further work will be carried out that can bring about a consensus of understanding across the chamber on what will be meant by sex and gender identity in the context of these census questions. Clarity, clarity remains key to ensure that appropriate responses will be given. The Law Society of Scotland have highlighted that this is, this is a necessity for everyone involved when it comes to the questions being asked for those answering, interpreting and using the data. Key stakeholders need to be aware of the relevant guidelines that will be put in place and must be consulted beforehand so that, so that it meets all the requirements. And what is clear is that the wording of the question is still very much subject to debate. To make some final points, I note that whilst the inclusion of the question on sexual orientation has not prompted any obvious concern, and as the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned, it will be important to consider how this may impact young people in particular when the form is being completed by the head of the household and I am pleased to see that this will be looked at. I also note, clarifica I also note the clarification from the Cabinet Secretary that intersex people will not be included within the term trans, recognising that their needs are different and I welcome the commitment to ensuring that future guidance clarifies this. To finish today, I would like to reiterate the Scottish Conservatives' support for this bill at stage one. Whilst the actual inclusion or wording of any such questions is not within the scope of this bill, it's clear that further work needs to be done. And as the development and testing of the census questions continues, I hope to see more clarity in the coming months. There has been a lot of stakeholder interest in this bill, so it is vital we strike a balanced approach and one that will support the census' goal of harnessing the most accurate and effective data. Thank you. I call Claire Baker for a generous six minutes. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be opening today's debate on stage one of the Census Amendment Scotland Bill for Scottish Labour. And I'm also fortunate enough to be a member of the committee who has listened to all the evidence and prepared the report for discussion today. I'd also like to thank all the organisations and individuals who have contacted us with briefings and comments in advance of today's debate. The Census has taken place every 10 years since the Census Act of 1920. It is an important exercise in understanding the nature of our population and informs the work of public bodies in making key decisions about resource allocation, policy development and how services are planned. It is a document which has changed over the years to reflect the changes in society and ensure that information gathered on the Census remains relevant. Since 1999, it's been the responsibility of this Parliament to scrutinise the census, particularly when new questions are introduced. 
any Cabinet Secretary may expect the process to be straightforward, and it has perhaps been surprising how contentious the framing of questions can be. This Census Amendment Bill is slightly different. This legislation is necessary as the questions being proposed are to be answered on a voluntary basis, unlike the compulsory nature of the majority of the questions. There is agreement across the committee and from the evidence received that it is appropriate to introduce questions on sexual orientation and transgender status on a voluntary basis, similar to the questions which are asked on religion. It is important that the overall completion rate of the census remains high and that people feel comfortable answering the questions. This legislation means that non-response to the questions would not lead to a penalty, which is the case with other questions. Introducing voluntary questions on these subjects is the purpose of the bill before us. We shouldn't lose sight of that and Labour supports the general principles today. The census is designed to reflect society and keep pace with the changing mores and expectations. Currently, there is no reliable data on the size of the transgender population in Scotland, and data on sexual orientation is only gathered from surveys and can then only provide an estimate. More accurate data would enable better planning of appropriate services, and greater recognition of the need for services for these groups of people who may be underrepresented and poorly served. The Equality Network and Scottish Trans Alliance did caution that the questions may not lead to an accurate account of the population, as the questions are sensitive and people may not wish to answer them. However, the data will still be valuable and should enable better understanding of the population over the years as the data is collected. The Stage 1 report, however, does raise a number of significant issues that the Cabinet Secretary must reflect on, and I welcome her statements this afternoon. The discussion and debate during Stage 1 was dominated by concerns expressed by witnesses that the legislation conflated sex and gender as a forerunner to a proposal to change the compulsory sex question in the Census. Although this was a divisive debate where it was difficult to achieve consensus, there was a growing agreement that the drafting of the bill is problematic. Following their evidence session, the National Records of Scotland wrote to the committee to state the intention behind the Census Bill was not to conflate the matter of sex and gender identity, but the wording of the bill does strongly suggest that. They also express a view that the power to ask questions on these issues already exists, and so in my view, the decision to insert, including gender identity, in Section 1 seems redundant and unnecessary, and has led to the conclusion that sex and gender identity are being conflated. <coughs> The Cabinet Secretary also made the argument that gender identity was being used as a way of future-proofing, that it was understood as a term and it could provide an umbrella term to enable future questions in this area to be introduced. Um, I don't agree with this. The, committee, the evidence the Committee heard made clear there is a lack of agreement on the definition of gender identity. As consideration of the Gender Recognition Act is ongoing, while the rights of transgender people are being debated, and consideration is being given to the recognition of non-gender, there is a public debate about these issues which has been conflated with the discussion around this bill. In these circumstances, I don't think it would be appropriate to use a catch-all term for any future questions, and that future questions should be specified and scrutinised by Parliament, and thus this short bill must be amended to make that clear. A proposed change to the binary sex question has been the key area of debate, even though it is not part of this bill. It is regrettable that the committee could not receive a consensus in the Stage 1 report. Even more so when the division is regarding an issue that's not actually included in the legislation. As someone who abstained on the committee, I asked myself the question, what would the vote achieve at this stage? A stage when the debate and evidence was divisive as well as contradictory and consensus was lacking. The government needs to decide whether or not to bring forward a census order which would change the sex question. And that is when the parliament will consider that question, consider the evidence in detail and make the decision. I have concerns that to take a vote at this stage was preemptive. The government's response to the stage one report still lacks clarity. However, the vote certainly gave the cabinet secretary a clear indication of the majority view of the committee. The stage one report is also critical of the consultation. I do not believe it was the intention of the national records to exclude anyone or any group from the involvement. I got the impression that they just completely failed to see that there may be a debate and there may be more than one point of view on the issue of the sex question. I welcome that wider consultation has now been undertaken. So we support the general principles of this bill, but I agree with the committee it needs significant amending to clarify the intention of the bill, and the Scottish Government must now seriously reflect on the wider discussion that took place in considering any future changes. Thank you.
I call Ross Greer. F around five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, it might be uh, very short, but this is an important piece of legislation. I'm uh, happy to support its principles at stage one, as are the, the Greens. The bill's purpose is to ensure that everyone feels able to accurately complete the census. It allows questions about sexuality and trans status or gender identity, as, as has been covered, uh, to be asked appropriately, namely as voluntary rather than mandatory questions. Because whilst we've made immense progress as a society, we are still not one free of bigotry. We are still a society where some people do feel that they need to hide parts of their own identity, parts of their own lived reality, and that is something that we must respect, which is why I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments in regards to young people in particular. It would be incorrect, it would be inappropriate to compel someone to answer a question on something as intensely personal as their sexuality or their trans status. But at the same time, the opportunity to collect this data from those who are happy to provide it is an opportunity to meet the needs of those who can too often go unnoticed and unsupported. It's a small change to something that happens once a decade, but it's part of a process to ensure people's identities are respected, particularly when they engage with public services. There's a contrast here between the uh, size of the bill, it's essentially a single uh, page bill, and the significance of the census uh, and the effect that it has. The committee received submissions in support of the bill and of the principle of trans inclusion for many national and long-standing equality organisations, including the Equality Network, the Scottish Trans Alliance, Stonewall Scotland, Engender, Rape Crisis Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, Close the Gap and Equate. Uh, I thank them all, particularly for their supplementary evidence as this debate evolved very quickly into areas we weren't necessarily expecting. And on that, I know I'm not the only one to have been at, at times frustrated and disappointed by the, the stage one process. And what I see, as Claire Baker has uh, mentioned, is the digression of the debate into matters that were out with the scope of the bill. At times, the very validity and existence of trans and non-binary people were called into question. I know the upset and the anxiety that this has caused many vulnerable people, some of whom have been in touch with me throughout this process. What should have been a small technical change to the Census Act to ensure appropriate wording became instead a much wider equalities debate, one that I don't think we were prepared for. It became a debate about trans inclusion and whether or not these measures impact on the rights of cisgender women. It saddened me, for example, that we took oral evidence from only one trans person, for example. I think that would have been adequate for what we thought at the start was a relatively technical process on the technical bill, but not the much wider equalities debate that it became. And with so much of the debate centred around whether trans inclusion measures undermine the rights of cis women, we did not have any of the long-standing national women's organisations come before the committee, though I do appreciate their collective written submissions, particularly, as I said, the latter ones as the debate evolved. As I've stated, these women's organisations are supportive of the bill. They also have decades of experience of trans inclusion, and I wish that that had been reflected more in our stage one report. Legitimate concerns were raised and should be addressed in the broader debate on the introduction of trans inclusion measures, how trans inclusion measures intersect with services for women, including particularly women's only spaces, is one such concern. As Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland have highlighted, their experience providing support services for women who've experienced violence in a trans-inclusive manner has given them a huge amount of evidence to contribute to this debate. Their letter to the committee stated that, and I quote, it is very clear to us that trans-inclusion in our own organisations has not given rise to substantive concerns or challenges. Rather, trans women have added to our movements through their support, voluntary work, and as staff members, end quote. Some questions raised were very much within the scope, of course, uh, of the bill, particularly around data reliability and comparability. It was suggested that questions completed on the basis of self-ID, which is existing practice in the 2011 census, and the inclusion of a third option in the sex question, which would be a change, would harm the overall data set and in turn affect, for example, the planning of sex-based services. I believe that some of these fears here are misplaced, and I would point in particular to the submission from the Head of Engagement for NHS National Service, the body that oversees the patient information database. The NHS uses its own data rather than the census in service planning, and they already collect patient data on the basis of self-identification without issue. The Coalition of National Women's Organisations have extensive experience with this type of data, also stated that collecting this information in a trans-inclusive uh, fashion would be beneficial. 
Now, I dissented from the committee's conclusion in favour of a binary sex question. Like the respected women's and equalities organisations mentioned, I support a third option. Its inclusion allows more people to complete the census. As the NRS found, it increases response rates despite its reports to the contrary. It allows us to gather valuable data on a small and vulnerable group for whom we cannot practically gather such information in any other way and it does not negatively affect anyone else. Indeed, for all other purposes, this tiny number of people will be randomly redistributed into the male and female categories. So my question is, why not make a change which positively benefits a small and vulnerable group at no cost? I hope as this process moves forward, all members take the opportunity to listen to those whose lives and identities we're discussing. A role of this parliament should be to lift up the voices of Scotland's most marginalised. The Census Bill is one opportunity to do just that, which is why I support the principles of this bill. Alex Cole Hamilton for around five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to the committee for their work in this bill. It is not a committee on which I sit, but I have been uh, keeping abreast of its uh, developments from afar. We live, Presiding Officer, in more enlightened times, and that was brought home to me just uh, two weeks ago when our son, Kit, who's seven years old, came to me and said, uh, Dad, what is trans? So I thought, and I scratched my head, and I thought, uh, he's a very inquisitive boy, but and, uh, mature as well. And I said, um, well, do you remember in the summer, we had a family came to visit us from Australia, and they had a little boy your age called Hamish. Uh, but did you notice that Hamish always wore girls' clothes? And he said, yeah, I, I, I understand that. I, I recognize that now. And he said, well, that's because Hamish, although he was born a little boy, feels more like a little girl. And that's really trans. And Kit stopped and he said, oh my God, you mean to tell me that Hamish is from Australia? I like to think that that level of acceptance is the new generation that are children and young people, and that, that acceptance is wholesale and, and felt right across the board. But with that enlightenment, we should reflect that in the public policy, and that is largely from where this debate stems. And I recognize, as uh, Ross Greer uh, articulated in his remarks, that a tension does exist between cisgender women and the intersectionality of the, the trans community. And I have been dismayed by some of the arguments in that debate. Uh, they have been at times characterized by hyperbole and at its most extreme, the suggestion that the advancement of trans rights represents a threat to public safety. Presiding officer, that is reminiscent of arguments used against gay men in the 1980s and they are as inaccurate today as they were then. For my party, for this bill, that stems from first principles. Trans men are men, trans women are women, and non-binary is valid. How we reflect that in the conduct of our public policy matters. How we see them and count them is incredibly important uh, in terms of furthering their rights and their inclusion in our society. It is clear where the fault lines in this debate lie. In 2011, the guidance offered for the first time people to fill in the mandatory sex question um, irrespective of the details of their birth certificate. For the trans community, that represented a breakthrough, a significant breakthrough. Um, and I have sympathy with Stonewall's concerns then. To, to remove that latitude, to change that guidance, would be very much a retrograde step because many found that 2011 census liberating, no longer anchored to their birth identity with and all the trauma and the process of shedding the connection to that that they've been through, they could finally uh, have society understand and include them for who they are. If there is a need for empirical evidence collection at birth, then we need to be clear, and the government needs to be clear about how it will square that circle. And I ask the government to work further with Stonewall and the Equalities Network to find a way to answer that empirical need without rowing back against the tide of the advancement of trans rights and inclusion. I also recognize the arguments and importance of uh, not having a binary question at that specific mandatory sex question. It's, uh, it's important for those who um, do not define either as male or female and who were not, or perhaps were born into sex, who would greatly struggle to answer a binary mandatory question. And perhaps we'll consider this point going fo forward. Our trans community, as I said at the top of my remarks, uh, presiding officer, deserve 
to be seen and to be counted. Being seen and being counted is the first steps to having your rights realised, whoever you are in our society. It, it happened when women got the vote. It happened when homosexuality homosexu was made legal. These marginalised communities actually being recognised as full citizens for who they are. And this bill and the census and the way we count our population is a fundamental cornerstone in the advancement of equality in this nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I move to open debate, there's time in hand so I can give all open speakers, if they wish, five minutes. I don't think Mr Stevenson will have any problem with that. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And some invitations are more welcome than others. This is one of them. Um, I, I have not uh, been part of the consideration of this bill up till now. Um, I am a data user of censuses, but also a user of censuses. In other words, um, my interest in genealogy means that I will lift and read a census every single week, but they're all 100 years old. That's of limited, but some interest to today's uh, debate. Spice tell us that the information on equality groups uh, in the census can be used to monitor discrimination and plan public services. And that's, of course, correct. But the thing we've got to bear in mind in all this debate, that it is a statistical survey and it isn't about identifying responses and needs of individuals, but of communities, often quite small communities, to make sure that the public uh, uh, services are provided appropriately. There's the SPICE also say the information collected must be authoritative, accurate and comparable for all parts of Scotland. Now, there is a difficulty uh, in that description of what we're trying to do. Authoritative, certainly. Uh, accurate, perhaps. And comparable, almost certainly. The comparable retaining the male-female for birth identity helps the comparability. But we've got to remember that at birth, it is the parent who registers the birth and registers what the gender of the infant is. And I have an example that's actually from exactly 150 years ago, where a child called Keith, I won't use the second name, there'll be living descendants. Uh, Keith was registered, as you would expect, as a male. But three years later in the census, and every subsequent census was shown as female. And in 1905, Keith married a man and gave birth to children. So therefore, an error probably an error, uh, was made at the point in uh, 1869 when Keith was born. So, because there is no medical requirement to provide information about gender to someone who's registering. You die, you need medical information on your death certificate. So therefore, there are some difficulties about authoritative. Uh, it is possible, as the example I've just given shows, to have something on your birth certificate and put something else uh, on your census. That's, that's always uh, always been there. Um, but of course, who fills out the census? And in broad terms, it is the head of the household. Now, I welcome the uh, indication that there will be a way for individuals to fill out information that they may not wish to share at that point with the head of the household. But equally, it's a voluntary question, so we won't get the answers from everybody for whom there might be a particular answer, and we won't necessarily get the answer for people who don't choose to use the separate system that allows them individually to respond. Now, that opens up the much broader question, which, for which I have no answer directly, eh, of how we therefore can rely statistically on a self-selected group using a self-selected description. Uh, I think it's possible to deal with that, but I hope that the National Records of Scotland might, by sampling perhaps, find out how the answers we've got do represent the underlying reality, because the statistics that come uh, from uh, our census are important in planning services. Now, voluntary questions are not new. They were introduced in the 1891 census, when the first time there was a question as to whether you spoke Gaelic you didn't have to answer the question. So there's nothing new about a voluntary question. Uh, we, can, we can do that uh, in this instance uh, as we did then. Now, I am uh, going to trust my colleagues as we take this bill forward. I won't uh, be playing any part on it. But I think the clear distinction between physical 
sex and how people wish to be treated, recognised and treated is an important one. Because I think it really is a human right in our society that people are able to choose how they are to be treated. That goes to the heart of this particular debate. And I very much welcome this tiny little legal provision, because it's really only a couple of lines in a very small bill, actually leverages very big consequences for quite a lot of people in our society. And I think it is right and proper uh, that we uh, take this forward in the way that we're planning to and continue to engage to make sure that the kind of questions we ask give us answers which statistically help us respond to a wide range of diverse needs that in the past we really didn't recognise and certainly didn't talk about. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. I call Jamie Halker Johnson to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Mr. Johnson, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I apologise for having to leave the chamber very briefly during uh, opening speeches. Um, at a length of one side of A4 paper, this is certainly one of the shortest bills that I've been invited to speak on in this chamber. However, within those short clauses, there are a number of sensitive issues that merit discussion here today. The bill touches on matters of individual identity and also how they relate not only to the public being engaged with the census, but also the eventual users of the data that uh, bring together. There are questions of approach here. The evidence presented to the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee shows that this remains controversial. And I'd incidentally like to express my thanks to the committee and its clerking team and all those who gave evidence in bringing together such a comprehensive report. One key objective of the bill is to place additional questions on a voluntary level. That's something, that, uh, that's something for which there seems to be wide agreement. As with sexual orientation, it's clear that a number of people will not feel comfortable disclosing details of this nature. In relation to the proposals being set out for additional areas of questioning, the National Records of Scotland have indicated their view in a letter to the committee that the power to ask questions on gender identity already exists and is covered by the Census Act 1920. The precise wording will be considered later. The voluntary nature, therefore, is a key part where wide agreement can be found. At stage one debate, uh, sorry, a stage one debate is not really the place to be thrashing out the substance of these questions in any great detail. Indeed, there has been the suggestion that this bill is perhaps not the appropriate place either. either. We can, however, look at the basis for proposing them and for, in, in essence, expanding the scope of the census further into areas of gender identity and orientation. The census, the census has a long history in the United Kingdom, having been conducted every 10 years since 1801, barring 1941, of course, when we were in the midst of the Second World War. We can, of course, look back even further into the past to see much earlier historical precedents. John Rickman, the statistician, uh, statistician most responsible for the first modern census, pointed out that the intimate knowledge of any country must form the rational basis of legislation. Every administration in our history has valued accurate data on its population. Today, questions on sex, gender, and identity significantly provide an understanding of groupings within society and can protect against discrimination. The nature of how these questions are asked has undoubtedly been the key area of interest for those responding to the committee through written, through written submissions. Many of these are detailed and well-considered, but they present very different viewpoints. A message that comes through is, as the bill progresses, we are going to have to consider and tackle some of these core issues. A thread that connects these differing viewpoints are questions about clarity and accuracy of data that must be answered. The committee has recognized the shortcomings in the last census. Supporting guidance indicated how transgender people could answer questions about sex. However, this was only published online and was not part of the census form itself. There seems to have been a very real capacity for confusion and it's right that the committee calls for absolute clarity in the approach ahead of 2021. Where voluntary questions are ill-conceived, there is also the potential for lower response levels. Presiding officer, as we approach this bill, we should recognize that there are strong, honestly held competing views around parts of it. These will likely garner the larger share of public attention and commentary. One area that we can join together on is to insist that there are plans in place to ensure that questions are statistically useful, that they are clear to respondents, and that we take a consistent and rational approach to implementing voluntary questions. I have little doubt that there will be further discussion in relation to the questions that this bill enables, and I hope that an approach can be found that respects the views of all those involved. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I call Kenneth Gibson to follow by Pauline McNeill. Mr <coughs> Gibson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee, I'm pleased to speak in today's debate. One may wonder at the amount of evidence taken in respect of a one-page bill. However, this is because the consultation threw up important questions around sex and gender, gender as we've already heard uh, this afternoon. The bill's purpose is actually very straightforward, to make answering census questions about prescribed aspects of gender identity and sexual orientation voluntary. Given the sensitivity of such questions and concerns some respondents might understandably have about intrusion into their private lives, the voluntary nature of the questions is of the utmost importance. Since the 2011 census, extensive research, including the National Records of Scotland Census 2021 topic consultation, has built a strong case to justify the inclusion of questions on sexual orientation and gender identity. This is relevant to the public sector equality duty placed on authorities to eliminate discrimination and advance equality of opportunity. Robust data on sexual orientation and gender identity will also help inform future policy and ensure best practice across Scotland. For example, accurate information on the size and geographic spread of the transgender population will more effectively help to plan gender dysphoria services, thereby ensuring resources are placed where their impact can be optimised. To gather this data, the Bill adds gender identity and sexual orientation to the schedule of matters about which particulars may require to be given. This also provides a power to prescribe aspects of gender identity, such as transgender or trans history, for the purpose of making questions about these aspects voluntary. Of course, the precise form of the questions will be considered as part of the census order and census regulations procedure set, usually scrutinised by Parliament the year before the census, and it is not within the scope of this bill. I'm pleased the Cabinet Secretary confirmed she will work with the committee after stage three of this bill and throughout 2019 so that we may properly scrutinise the census questions before they are formally considered by Parliament. This will allow a more evidence-led approach to ensure the questions are as robust as possible. Undeniably, these are sensitive issues and during evidence sessions, I was impressed by the measured and considered tone used by witnesses, sometimes with diametrically opposite opinions. Based on the evidence, with contributions ranging from academia to equality organisations to women's groups, our report makes key recommendations, some pertain to the precise question forms rather than the Census Bill itself. Firstly, we recommend that the mandatory sex question in the 2021 Census should remain binary. This is based on the evidence of organisations like Women's Place UK, who maintain that an individual's biological sex is an immutable characteristic and because sex is a protected characteristic under the Equality Act 2010, which should not be conflated with gender identity. I trust that the government will heed the committee's clear view on the phrasing of the mandatory sex question and take this forward as subordinate legislation is developed. I'm pleased the government is committed to amending the census bill at stage two to ensure gender identity and sex are not conflated. As the Equality Network suggested, including gender identity could be removed from the bill, leaving paragraph one of the schedule to the 1920 Act regarding the mandatory sex question unchanged. Trans status could then be added as a category for census questions on the same basis proposed for sexual orientation. Another key recommendation is for all guidance relating to the 2021 census to clarify that intersex does not fall within the term trans. Again, I'm pleased the government has confirmed that NRS will work with stakeholders to develop guidance using the appropriate language and terminology. The evidence emphasised that intersex should not be viewed within the prism of gender identity as a medical condition. And I particularly thank DSD Families, an information support charity promoting the rights and well-being of children with physical sex de 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 developmental differences for their illuminating evidence. Presiding officer, I support the principles of the bill and believe changes to the census are appropriate given the societal shift Scotland has experienced since 2011. Thanks to the thoughtful contributions of all parties, we now have the opportunity to remedy some of the deficiencies highlighted by the committee's report and I look forward to working with colleagues to develop the census order going forward and also the cabinet secretary. Thank you very much Mr Gibson. I call Polly McNeill to be followed by Stuart McNeill and Ms McNeill please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The census is vitally important and it gives us a complete picture of the nation, or at least it should. And given it is only conducted every 10 years, this is important that we get it right. It is an analysis of the character of society and it is a vital piece of information in which to make decisions about budgets and society going forward. 
Mayor Kemen, Joan McAlpine, on an excellent speech on behalf of the committee, which showed how diverse and complex the issue can get, but I well understood everything that she said. If we want central and local government to offer the best and the most responsive public services, then policies must be based on high quality evidence. Moreover, data on sex and gender, as well as ethnic group data, can help to identify the extent and the nature of disadvantage in the UK, an issue that we're all signed up for. Engender has noted that public authorities are increasingly sharing their confusion with them around how to gather service user data around sex and gender. And they point out that the census has an important role in setting a precedence. In gender, say, because of its scale, the census plays an important normative role in shaping how information is gathered in other more frequent or localised data gathering. I'm grateful to Engender for an excellent briefing on this. It is important, as others have said, that people can feel comfortable answering questions on sexual orientation and transgender status. It is right that the questions being proposed are to be answered on a voluntary basis reflected in the committee's um, agreement to this. I'm also pleased that the committee took on board the concerns raised by witnesses that the bill at times appears to conflate sex and gender identity. And even if that was not the intention, I'm pleased that this, these concerns will be addressed at stage two because we need to be clear that there's a big difference. In a survey of LGBT Youth Scotland in 2017, 85% of LGBT people, young people said that transphobia was a problem in Scotland. 41% of transgender young people said they had experienced a hate crime or hate incidents in the previous year. So given the high level of concerns raised, it's important that we try to gather the best data that we can at a minimum to try and find out how comprehensively as possible how many people identify as transgender. I've long believed that this parliament in its work on equality has a job to do in focusing on the rights and the needs of the transgender community. And I, for one, would be uh, very welcome to hear how the extent of the transgender community through the census. I also welcome the clarification from the cabinet secretary that intersex people will not be included in the term trans. And to be perfectly honest, I'm quite astonished that a memorandum could have mixed up the two. Um, these two groups should be, should not be, and cannot be thought of as one. Uh, other members have described what an intersex <coughs> person is, and it's quite a distinct thing. It's quite a distinct person. Um, I just wanted to say something about the recommendations from LGBT youth in my closing remarks, because I think this question of the privacy of young people, and in fact any person in a household, and it's worth asking in the Cabinet Secretary in summing up uh, uh, what the definition of a householder these days of equality is going to be. But, um, but I think it's one of the most important issues to try and resolve. So the suggestion from LGBT Youth Scotland um, is that there's another process that could run alongside that, that would be voluntary. I am absolutely in favour of this. I, I just know that we have to give quite a bit of thought to how we can make sure that that data is matched properly and that there isn't um, any loss of data as a result of it. So 100% behind this idea, but I just want to make sure that we can make sure that the data matches. So I welcome the committee's recommendations that the Scottish Government should further consult with a range of organisations representing intersex people in order to improve the information and specialist services available to support children and families of people who have differences of sex development. Um, I conclude the presiding officer by thanking the committee for their excellent work in this regard. Thank you very much. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Mr Ewing will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, at the outset, I'd like to associate myself with the comments made by the convener uh, regarding everyone who provided evidence and also participated at, uh, at this stage one process. I genuinely have found uh, this bill to be fascinating and also enlightening in equal measure. Uh, the strength of the evidence uh, that we heard certainly provided me with a, a lot of thinking uh, to do, but also to try to fully comprehend uh, the issues uh, that were raised. Now, I did not expect the, the breadth of evidence to be as such when the bill was both so short, but also mainly facilitating the process to ask a voluntary question. I'm content uh, with the report our committee has produced, and equally so with the response from the Cabinet Secretary 
and a letter uh, dated the 22nd of February. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has uh, clearly appreciated the, the genuine concerns raised by those giving evidence and also our subsequent report. And I'm pleased that at this early stage, uh, she has confirmed amendments will be forthcoming at stage two. I want to highlight a, a few aspects about the report, starting with the, the final section, that's the consultation section, it's sections 122, 129. I found that the lack of consultation by NRS concerning, and in particular with uh, women's groups, that's paragraphs 120, 121 of the report. I the thought that there had to be strong reasons for this to actually be the case. The Cabinet Secretary's reply uh, was indeed helpful in this regard uh, by stating that no women's groups responded to the public consultation and some were not established at this early consultation stage. With the NRS consultation taking place between the 8th of October 2015 and the 15th of January 2016, it could be possible that uh, with the upcoming parliamentary elections, then the various groups uh, in existence may well have been focusing uh, upon other issues, including their own manifesto developments. However, with no response from any of them, I would have hoped that the NRS would actually have went back to them uh, after the 2016 election. However, uh, this work is clearly underway now, and I generally am thankful and am pleased that this is the case. So, you know, sir, I want to base the, the remainder of my comments uh, with uh, the following two points as the, the backdrop. The section 11 of uh, our report, and that's the committee agrees that there has been a considerable social change with regard to issues concerning sexual orientation since 2011. And also section 75 and the quote from the Cabinet Secretary. That was the census does not lead public opinion. The census has to reflect society as it is just now and ask questions that maximise the response rate so that the data can be used. Clearly, the, the, the 2011 census will have been more appropriate for that time, but it's right that the census goes through a rigorous analysis and process before it actually takes place. And our committee divided on one issue, whether the mandatory sex question should be binary. Clearly, clearly it is a defining issue for many people, and I appreciate the strength of feeling on both sides of the debate. Now, my decision uh, came down uh, to the following three points. First of all, the ease of gathering data. Secondly, how the information gathered will be analysed and used. But also, thirdly, the consistency of data gathering. Now, I appreciate that the recommendation will have disappointed and potentially angered some people and organisations. However, I believe that the recommendation was made for the best of intentions by those who voted for it. I also believe that colleagues who took a different position did so for the exact same reasons. I believe that the, the audience, sorry, the evidence that we heard from Professor Susan McVie of Edinburgh University it was very powerful. That was section 60 of our report, uh, where she stated that it is a fundamental property of research that in designing a questionnaire, you need to be extremely clear about what you're measuring. Possibly controversially, I think that the General Register Office of Scotland got it wrong when it redesigned the census in 2011 and conflated sex and gender identity. It did come as a surprise to me, therefore, to read in the Cabinet Secretary's letter that the NRS testing seemed to indicate that a non-binary question will lead to a higher response rate. Uh, however, I, I generally would be grateful uh, if the NRS could actually provide further information regarding the testing results and also the, the suggestion of maintaining a binary sex question. The, the conflation of sex and gender identity became apparent during the early stages of our scrutiny. Therefore, I'm sure it came as no surprise to many people uh, that we highlighted this uh, very much so in the report in section 9. Uh, presenting officer, um, just a final point is just regarding the DSD families, which have been touched upon uh, by some other colleagues. I'd never heard of DSD families uh, beforehand, and I'm grateful for the briefing that we actually received from them. And I generally was humbled about uh, what I heard uh, from them, and also the challenges faced by individuals and families uh, every single day. Uh, and the, certainly, as the, as the Cabinet Secretary indicated uh, in her evidence, uh, and also the letter, the policy memorandum will thankfully be amended to reflect more accurate descriptions of intersex and trans people. And I'm, I'm also pleased that our recommendation section 119 will be progressed. Uh, presenting officer, I welcome the progress of the bill and the amendments that will take place at stage two, and I'm pleased to vote for the, the general principles here today at stage one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. Annabel Ewing, then we move to closing speeches. Ms Ewing, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And uh, also as a member of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee, I am uh, pleased to have been called to speak in the sp stage one debate today on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill. As we have heard, this indeed is a very short bill. It has three sections maximum and one page. However, notwithstanding that, 
as we have heard, it has generated quite a lot of discussion, given wider issues that have been raised that are not, in fact, intended to be within the scope of the bill. However, before turning briefly to some of those wider issues, I think it is important to focus at the outset on what the purpose of the bill actually is. And that is to ensure that certain questions can be asked on a voluntary basis in the next census scheduled for Sunday 21 March 2021. Indeed, it is the desire to make the questions voluntary that in fact triggers the need, paradoxically, for primary legislation. The questions concerned relate, in terms of the bill is currently drafted, as we have heard, to gender identity and to sexual orientation. And it was felt that in the interest of privacy and potential sensitivities involved, that it would be best to pose those questions on a voluntary basis. And, as we have heard, there has been widespread support for this approach from a range of public bodies, from the Law Society of Scotland and from various equalities organisations and from others. Uh, and, as we have heard, it is also worth uh, noting that when a question on religion was introduced for the first time in the 2001 census, it was also included on a voluntary basis, so there is precedent, presiding officer, for this approach. Um, where the bill has generated rather more discussion results in effect from what can only be regarded as confusing, if not, in fact, technically defective uh, drafting. Specifically, there is a reference to amending the relevant schedule to the 1920 Census Act by inserting the wording, and I quote, including gender identity, end of quote, after the word sex, in terms of what broad subject headings questions can be asked upon. This has been flagged up as conflating gender identity with sex. Uh, and further to the concerns raised, the committee has been seeking clarification that the bill will indeed be amended at stage two to delete this confusing reference. And I am pleased to know that the Cabinet Secretary, uh, in her evidence, has agreed to reflect specifically on this point. This initially flawed approach, I, I would submit, uh, together with some rather precipitate comments in the policy memo about decisions that it will be, in fact, for this Parliament to make in due course in terms of the subsequent census draft order. Uh, but these um, elements have led to a wider discussion at this stage about the binary nature of sex and the mandatory sex question in the census, the mandatory question not being within the scope of the bill. Evidence was received in this regard by a, a number of people and organisations uh, and different points were raised. Evidence was received, however, to the effect that the uh, on the scientifically uh, grounded theory of human sexual dimorphism. Evidence was also received reminding the committee that sex is, uh, under the 2010 Equality Act, a protected characteristic. And evidence was received that highlighting, uh, the, uh, highlighting rather the conflation of sex with gender identity is a social construct becoming more widespread. For example, Dr. Kath Murray, who gave evidence, commented on the impact of this trend stating, and I quote, this blurring which has the effect of changing what it means to be female has implications for the protection of women's rights, end of quote. Uh, aside from the wider issues raised by the evidence on this subject, it is, uh, which in four minutes, I'm afraid, I don't know, four and a half, I can't go into in five, great. Five minutes. Going up, yeah, five. I can't, nonetheless, have, I don't have time to go into that in, in the detail I would like. But I think it is worth pointing out, as regards this debate in the context of the Census Bill, that the National Records of Scotland and evidence taken from a Amy Wilson, their Head of Census Statistics, said, uh, and I summarise, that even if there were to be a non-binary sex question, the National Records of Scotland would just randomly assign people back into male and female and that they would still produce outputs on a male and female basis. And I would submit that that rather begs the question as to what would then be the point of including a non-binary question in a census which is supposed to adhere to the highest statistical standards and provide longitudinal cons uh, consistency. Uh, the ONS and England and Wales have proposed that the mandatory sex question remain binary as far as the 2021 census is concerned. And as we've heard, the committee recommended by six votes to one with two abstentions, that the mandatory sex question remain binary. I entirely support that recommendation, presenting officer, and just one sentence in conclusion would be to say that I very much welcome indeed the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to further 
consideration of how people's privacy can be uh, respected when completing the census in their own households, a point that I raised at committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Ms. Ewing. And I call the Claire Baker to close for Labour. Ms Baker, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. This has been an interesting debate and provides the Chamber with an insight into the broader issues the Committee has been considering through this fairly humble piece of legislation. It may be surprising, given the degree of debate, that the expectation is the Bill will pass at Stage 1, as the Committee recommends. While the issue of the sex question has been a key focus of the debate, members have identified other issues. Um, Polly McNeill talked about the LGBT youth briefing that we received, which was very helpful and I think highlights the growing need for the census to support confidentiality as questions are becoming more intimate. Um, I urge the Cabinet Secretary to consider the proposals from LGBT youth and I welcome her comments on privacy rights this afternoon, which I will reflect on. Um, Annie Wells raised the issue of the self-identification model in 2011 and so guidance was provided in the 2011 census that allowed self-identification on the sex question for transgender men and women which was available only if you sought it out online and raised the question of how widely understood that position was. Um, the committee did hear evidence that this approach in the 2011 census compromised the data as well as counter evidence about the extent of any impact of this and that is an issue the Cabinet Secretary needs to reflect on. Um, I did have a look at the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Act 2018, which was recently passed, which had a pretty prescriptive transgender definition because it states that the term woman includes someone who has had gender reassignment or is living as a woman and intending to undergo gender reassignment. The guidance for the 2011 census was different and it enabled self-identifying as a different gender. And I wonder where all this fits in with the review of the Gender Recognition Act that is ongoing. And I think this lack of consistency is problematic. While the debate about whether or not to change the existing binary question uh, was a key concern of the committee and the witnesses, the committee was taking evidence in the dark. It is unclear what the government's intention is, and today's debate hasn't made that any clearer. The Scottish Government and the NRS has created a situation with this bill that they didn't appear to anticipate or prepare for. The policy by memorandum to the bill says in the section concerning the sex question, looking forward to 2021, consultation has identified the need for a more inclusive approach to measuring sex. The sex question being proposed for the 2021 census will continue to be one of self-identification and will provide non-binary response options. However, following the appearance at the committee, which was the end of our evidence-taking sessions, the National Records wrote to say, we are currently considering whether or not to have a non-binary response option for the sex question, but it's too early to say if this will be the final proposal as testing and consultation continues. And the Cabinet Secretary at the committee said, the policy memorandum says that the 2021 sex question will have a non-binary response option. It should have said that this approach is being considered and tested. This lack of clarity was very unhelpful and this area of debate has dominated the evidence even though it is not part of this bill. As the convener outlined, the ONS have confirmed that there will be no change to the question in their forthcoming sentence. Uh, Ross Greer outlined the arguments supporting a change to the sex question. I understand that it would enable some people to answer the question based on how they live their life. I appreciate the feelings of a non-binary person that the choice they are presented with does not reflect their lived experience. However, the NRS and evidence said that they would then just assign a sex to the respondent. In the committee, they said, if we ask a non-binary question, that is the big if, and it is obviously something for the committee to take a view on, we do not propose to produce outputs on a non-binary basis. In our conversations with stakeholders, we have always been consistent it is about allowing people to respond in a way that reflects how they identify, but that we will still produce outputs on a male and female basis. We have discussed with stakeholder groups the fact that we would randomly assign people back into male and female categories because, as the numbers are expected to be very small, they will not affect the statistical distributions, which begs the question over how this information contributes to the data collected by the census, which I understand is the purpose of the census. I would welcome clarity on what purpose a change to the binary question would serve and perhaps the Cabinet Secretary can respond to that issue. There's also an assumption made by NRS that the numbers are expected to be very small. There 
I'm not sure the committee was completely convinced that you could be so confident of that. Um, so there is a lack of consensus on this approach, which makes it problematic. As others have said this afternoon, it was only in the 2021 census that it's being proposed to include a voluntary question on sexual orientation. In the policy memorandum, the reason for this is described as a question on sexual orientation was considered for inclusion in the 2011 census. However, the level of public acceptance of the question was not considered sufficient to merit its inclusion in that census. Given the evidence the committee heard, there is clearly questions to be answered over the level of public acceptance over a change to this binary sex question. Consideration must be given to whether there are other ways for the census to meet the needs of non-binary people, and a two-stage question has been suggested. Stuart McMillan talked about the inadequacies in the consultation. This debate has really grown since the proposal changes to the GRA, and that is really the nub of the debate. And it's unfortunate that the census comes before a resolution to that issue. Um, Mr McMillan also said the census doesn't lead to public opinion. And this was different from Ross Greer, who talked about, and I may misquote here, but he seemed to talk about the census moving the debate forward and taking a lead on equality's agenda. And the Cabinet Secretary could perhaps provide clarity on her views of the purpose of the census. So the debate at committee has been a microcosm of the wider debate that is taking place around possible changes to the Gender Recognition Act. But within that debate, we should not lose sight of other issues that impact on LGBT people. The brief from LGBT Health and Wellbeing highlights some of those issues. The LGBT population is subject to multiple disadvantage. For example, 74% of LGBT Health and Wellbeing service users disport, sorry, report disability, compared to 20% of the general population, and 27% report unemployment, compared to 3.7% of the general population. We know that prejudice exists towards that community and that physical and verbal assault is all too common. Access to appropriate health services is not always easy and that people can face isolation from their families and their community. While I fully recognise the concerns that are being expressed around enabling self-identification for trans people and what this means in terms of women's spaces and women's rights, we must also recognise that the LGBT community are often vulnerable and open to exploitation and assault themselves. We need to chart a path through this debate in a sensitive and understanding manner which recognises and addresses the concerns of everyone about the impact of these changes and work hard to achieve understanding and consensus. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Alexander Stewart, close to the Conservatives. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased to have the opportunity to contribute to this important debate this afternoon on the first stage of the Census Amendment Bill of Scotland and closing on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. It is clear that as our society changes over time, we must adapt the way that we record information and reflect these changes. The Equalities Act of 2010 requires public authorities to fulfil certain public sector equality duties. Public bodies need the aim to eliminate discrimination, harassment and victimisation, advance equality of opportunity between different groups and foster good relations between different groups. That is very much the theme of where we are today. And it's also vitally important that we have a, a rich set of data, and, and it is the data and the information in order to allow public bodies, bodies to fulfill their public sector equality duties. The bill and its introduction to these two voluntary questions will undoubtedly help to plug some of the information gaps that we've been recognised exist when it comes to equalities, particularly in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity. Submissions from a wide range of organisations and individuals uh, have, have shown how supportive uh, they are of some of these inclusion questions. And as a member of the committee myself, uh, I, I pay tribute to many of the individuals who did give uh, oral and written evidence uh, to the committee. And it's only right that these questions are voluntary ones. Sexual orientation and gender identity can be challenging for many individuals at different stages of their lives. As we know, and as we've already heard, LGBT people can often face discrimination and abuse. Uh, and that became a, a very much part of the process as well, because they find themselves alienated, discriminated against and challenged. Uh, and, and we need to do all we can to support that mechanism. Uh, and to make such questions compulsory would threaten uh, individuals with a fine or a non-compulsory. That, that in itself is not 
what we should be doing to try and secure uh, that people uh, have the opportunity and that they can and do uh, feel that they are being taken uh, on board and their views and opinions are being recognised. It's also worth noting, Deputy Presiding Officer, that the UK Government's white paper published last year reaches similar conclusions on the issue of questions of sexual orientation and gender identity. As the Scottish Government's proposed approach, it is not uh, compulsory for people to give their sexual orientation or gender identity, and they should feel that they do not wish to do so. Ministers have the... Uh, I've also indicated that it is right uh, not to answer these two questions and should be clear in the legislation before the census is taken. As has been mentioned by other contributors this afternoon, the debate is important to note that the bill does not change how people legally change their agenda. That is not what we are discussing. The issue of gender identity will separately be debated in the Scottish uh, Parliament uh, when it comes uh, and gender identity will comes before this chamber later on. It has also been an interesting debate. Uh, we've had many contributions from individuals who feel quite strongly and quite passionately about where we are. Uh, my, my colleague Annie Wells noted the concerns of the committee around the confliction of sex and gender identity, as well as the concerns of the lack of clarity around awareness of online guidance uh, that was put forward uh, in the approach in 2011. And, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm delighted that the Cabinet Secretary has taken on board uh, some of the consultation needs, that the consultation needs to be robust uh, uh, and that further consultation requires to be done to ensure that people have the confidence in that consultation because there were some in individuals and organisations who did feel that that consultation was uh, lacking in some way uh, and I think that that has now been uh, acknowledged uh, and we will, we will take that as we go forward. Annie Wells also commented about the, the clarification from the, the Cabinet Secretary of intersex people who will not be included in the terms trans, uh, recognising their needs as a different. And I welcome the commitment to ensuring that there will be future and further guidelines upon this. Uh, our own convener, uh, Joe McAlpine, talked about uh, the privacy of young people must be protected uh, uh, in this whole process. And that, I believe, is vitally important. Uh, you know, we, 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 we need to ensure that the data collected and the information that we have uh, is robust. But at the same time, we must protect individuals uh, who feel that they are being threatened or they have a, 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 a conflict uh, themselves uh, and that the information that they will give and that will be put on, on their behalf it is clarified and clear. Um, Claire Baker talked about highlighting highlighting uh, how there was agreement uh, across the committee on many aspects of it, but it was all about ensuring that we have accurate data. Uh, and the complexity of the whole issue uh, has to be looked at. So yes, we have to consider uh, looking at changes, uh, and changes will be required to come forward in stage two. Alex Co Hamilton talked about living in an enlightened times, uh, and I think that is vitally important. We need to recognise the rights of people. This policy matters. This bill may only be small, but it matters. And going forward, we must support communities and individuals who feel marginalised and threatened uh, within their community. Jamie Halko Johnson uh, talked about the sensitivity of the nature of the bill and the approach of the committee towards that. Censuses have been going since 1801, and we, are, and we appreciate that. But the accurate data is so important because there have been uh, shortcomings in the past, and these should not be uh, what we're looking at as we move forward into the future. Annabel Ewing talks about the evidence that that was received, and we received a lot of evidence uh, from different organisations and from different individuals who felt very passionate about this process and wanted to ensure that they got their uh, views and opinions across. Uh, and I think as members of the committee, we certainly heard that. Uh, and I think that's vitally important uh, because, because sex is a protected characteristic uh, in this whole process, and, and that has come through. But as I say, it's vitally important that we get the, the, the information uh, and, and that privacy uh, is protected uh, during this entire process, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, so the Scottish Conservatives are in agreement with the broad principles of the bill. We will, and we look, uh, and we would like to see a number of uh, important changes, such as further clarification uh, on the distinction between mandatory and voluntary questions and how the census will define structure and the community uh, and the compulsory uh, elements of that when it comes to uh, gender identity. Uh, so therefore, we will be supportive at stage one, but we will seek to look at amendments in stage two because the stakeholders have made that quite clear to us that we need to take on their views and their opinions and have a balanced approach uh, so 
that we do get, you know, the whole idea of the census is to ensure that we have the correct data and that the data is there for everyone to be used. So it's vitally important that we take that approach and we do all we can because, as I said before, we owe it to the individuals who've come forward already and told us what they believe uh, and we should support them. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. I call on Fiona Hislop to close the Government Cabinet Secretary to decision time, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to my parliamentary colleagues here today for what has been a sensible debate on a very sensitive uh, issue and matters. Uh, I and the committee uh, recognise that there are strong views on these issues. Um, and that some of them have been demonstrated here today, but it is vital that this whole debate is conducted in a respectful manner as it has been conducted during this debate itself in Parliament. This has been the first opportunity for Parliament to get involved in the 2021 Census in Scotland, but it really is just the start of our journey. And indeed, I think uh, it was Jamie Halcrow Johnson who mentioned that perhaps stage one was not necessarily uh, the time that we should be discussing the actual content of the questions, which is true. Um, and the bill is not necessarily the place to discuss the wider issues of gender recognition and some of the wider issues that have been touched on by a number of members. But we are where we are and we have to reflect the, the evidence that came forward during, uh, during the witness sessions. And actually address that because when we do get to the questions themselves during the, the regulations, these are issues that we will have to, to work through. Um, most people agree, uh, and I think it's really important um, that we underline this, most people agree that it is the right time to ask the two specific questions on sexual orientation and transgender, and that they should be asked on a voluntary basis. And, and that is the purpose of the Census Bill that's before us. But clearly, um, there has been a simulation and interest in wider uh, census matters. So I'm very proud to have portfolio responsibility for the census in Scotland and very keen to use the next two years to prepare for a successful and meaningful census. It is actually only 752 days until the census of 20, 21st March 2021, so the clock is very much uh, ticking down. I mentioned in my opening remarks that the people of Scotland must have confidence in the census as they are sharing their personal information. And the issues discussed here today demonstrate just how sensitive this information is. And we must meet legit, uh, legitimate expectations by ensuring that their data is kept safely and securely. And we must also keep the trust of the people of Scotland by asking the most appropriate questions that reflect our society at that time and that we do this sensitively. Yes. Maurice Corrie. I thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for taking the intervention. Will there be a response option or question to be included in the census to identify armed forces veterans? Uh, I'm, I'm, deli I'm delighted that we uh, have already announced that. I'm surprised Mr Corrie isn't aware of that. That was an announcement by Graham Day as part of the veterans uh, debate some time ago. That is our intention to have that. Um, again, that would be subject to the agreement of, of uh, Parliament it itself. Uh, but it's important uh, that we deliver on the trust um, that we, we, we have with the people of Scotland. Uh, we've done that over 200 years of data collection, and we should be very proud of our achievements. Some questions have come and gone, but we've also been uh, consistent in our professional approach to the census with the tracking of the core data. Whilst a significant focus for 2021 is about it being the first digital census, being primarily online, asking the right questions in the appropriate way is still at the heart of the census. And that is why National Records of Scotland has carried out significant stakeholder engagement over recent years and continues to take this forward to ensure we have the best possible census. And the discussions on the bill have contributed to that process with, for example, uh, National Records of Scotland now actually actively engaging with women's groups who responded to the committee's call for evidence. Some of those groups hadn't, were, hadn't even uh, existed at the time of the initial uh, public consultation. And I wish to be very clear, no stakeholder has intentionally been excluded from engagement and consultation by NRS. Everyone with, with an interest in census questions is encouraged to engage with the process. So even though extensive testing of options for these questions was carried out prior to the bill, which included thousands of people in Scotland from across society, some views have emerged uh, recently as a response to the call for evidence. So the door is still wide open and we welcome the views of others. I want to address a number of points. Um, Joe McAlpine had asked about the issue around the wording. Now, the wording in the bill currently says 
um, that sex, including gender identity. Now, I think having the association of including gender identity with sex quite clearly can conflate that issue, and we are open to making sure that we can address that issue, and in particular, uh, looking to, to identify where the transgender question could actually uh, come, into, come into being. I also want to reflect that we, a very important point, the ONS and, and what's happening in England and Wales, it looks to be that they will uh, revert to and continue with uh, a binary question on sex, but it will be self-identified as it was in 2011. And I think there's a genuine issue that the committee and all of us will have to consider because if we don't necessarily um, have a binary question that's self-identified, um, then what, how do transgender people particularly answer that question? If it's a mandatory question, um, how do we make sure um, that we have the opportunities for them to address that? There is an issue around whether we had, and if we have an issue of a non-binary question on the sex question, that would avoid self-identification of male and female, as would be otherwise be the case in a binary question. So these are all the, the points that have to be considered. Um, because remember, it's a, the sex question is a mandatory question. So if you don't have the options, how do people then actually complete it? And we need people to, uh, to complete um, the, the survey. I think the important thing for the trans, transgender um, people particularly is having that voluntary question. And that's the vital one that we can agree to today. And I think it's very important. There was also, I think, um, some questions about you know, what would get the best response. And it might surprise the committee because they just assumed that a binary question would have the better response rate. On the testing of 5,000, over 5,500 people, actually the non-binary sex question had um, the, the lowest level of non-response. Marginal, to, very marginal. And that's the information that will be shared with the committee. The two-stage question, which I think might have been referred to by Claire Baker, actually had a much lower response rate. So actually the credibility and uh, the ability to count is absolutely important. So that's the information that at the next stage of the consideration of the census will be considered as part of the regulation. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Joan McAlpine. Yeah, she, she recognises that the reason why the committee majority opposed uh, a non-binary sex question was because of the longitudinal quality of the data over time, because male-female question has been asked since 1801. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, yes, I recognise the longitudinal aspect. Uh, they also said it was uh, because it would have a higher response rate, which isn't necessarily the case, but then we can still look again at, at how we consider these questions. Uh, but I do think that on the basis that the 2011 one was on a self-identified uh, basis, that's again something that the committee will have to consider uh, when they look at the next stage, which is the questions. Annie Wells uh, said that we're looking for clarity and we need to write uh, to strike a balanced approach. I think she's absolutely right. Claire Baker made a very important point about whether we should future-proof census or not. And actually, the experience we've had today is perhaps every 10 years, we will have to have legislation in order to debate issues that might be controversial. Those of who can remember 2011 will remember actually language was an issue that had some controversy around it at that time. So perhaps we might have to reflect on that. Uh, Ross Greer made a very important points about the equality area, but I think this comes back to the point, should the census lead debates or should the census reflect the society that we live in? And I think it's important that it reflects the society that we live in. Uh, Stuart Stevenson has always made very interesting points, and I think a very fundamental one, that the census is about statistical service. It's not about individual's service. Uh, and I think that's very important, that it is authoritative, that people have confidence in it. Um, in relation to Stuart Maxwell, he asked about the better response rate. I think I've addressed that. Um, Claire, uh, sorry, Polly McNeil asked about the definition of householder. There is a definition, which I think uh, from the point of time we will send to you, because it, it is detailed to, to make sure we've got clarity on that. But, presiding officer, everyone who's contributed today has touched on different aspects of the committee's assessment and report. It's highlighted uh, the current drafting of the bill, and in particular the way the term gender identity has been used, has created some confusion and a perce perception of sex and gender identity that they're being conflated, which we don't want, so therefore amendments will come forward at the next stage. I wish to be very clear, it was never our intention to conflate sex and gender identity. Uh, the committee supports the proposal by the Equality Network to amend the draft bill to address this, and our thinking is very similar to that of the Equality Network. And as members will be aware uh, for some time, that it's Section 1 of the Census Act 1920, which provides the enabling power underpinning the undertaking of the census. 
and it allows the making of the census order, which will be the next stage in the regulation and the detailed questions that we will move to next. National Records of Scotland will be working closely with the committee in the run-up to the laying of the census order and the census regulation, and I'm very keen to ensure that there's sufficient time to ensure comprehensive understanding of all matters of Scotland's census in 2021. Presiding officer, perhaps it's a, a one-page bill, but it does, I think, address some of the fundamental issues that are, are confronting society just now. But I think uh, in all the comments we've had today, equality and the importance of championing equality by this parliament, I think, underlined everybody's contribution today, and I'm very pleased about that. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill. The next item is consideration of motion 16009 in the name of Andy Whiteman on the appointment of a member of the Standards Commission for Scotland. And could I call on Andy Whiteman to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I speak to the motion in my name as a member of the Corporate Body Appointment Panel to invite members of the Parliament to agree to the appointment of Ashley Dunn as a member of the Standards Commission for Scotland. The corporate body supports six independent office holders and one of our statutory duties relates to appointing with the agreement of Parliament some of the office holders. And this particular appointment today relates to the Standards Commission for Scotland. By way of background, the Standard Co Standards Commission's role is to encourage high ethical standards in public life by promoting and enforcing the codes of conduct for councillors and members of devolved public bodies. It issues guidance to councils and public bodies and adjudicates on alleged contraventions of the code referred to it by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. The Commission has a convener and four members, all of whom are part-time. Our nominee, Ashley Dunn, has a wealth of experience in public services specialising in organisational and leadership development and has over 20 years of experience in NHS management across the United Kingdom. We believe that Ashley will bring to the post professionalism, fairness and a strong commitment to ensuring high standards of conduct in public life are maintained and I'm sure that the Parliament will want to wish her every success in her new role. Presiding officer, I move the motion. Thank you very much, and the question on the motion will be put at decision time, to which we now turn. The first question this evening is that motion 16038, in the name of Fiona Hislop, on the Census Amendment Scotland Bill, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And the next question is that motion 16009, in the name of Andy Whiteman, on the appointment of a member of the Sanders Commission for Scotland, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. In that case, can I be the first to congratulate Ashley Dunn on her appointment? And, and that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.